Howdy again, everybody. This is Doc from Thoroughfan coming to you with the name behind the race. And just like I was talking two weeks ago, there's only one race this weekend that's on everybody's mind, and that is the middle jewel of the Triple Crown, the Preakness from Pimlico in Baltimore. Ken Always Dreaming add that middle jewel in his crown quest. We'll know in just about three days. The Preakness itself, though, is the race that we are going to feature on this uh, this segment, and it really has a very interesting history. Uh, when, when you look back just to how it was named, uh, who it was named after, and how it's evolved and changed, actually, uh, over the course of its history. So um, I hope you've had your fill of crab cakes. If not, go put a couple on, sit down in front of the old computer here, and join us as we look at this week's Name Behind the Race. The words crab cakes and middle jewel can only conjure up one image in a sports fan's mind, that being the Preakness Stakes in Baltimore in May. Older than the Kentucky Derby by two years, the Preakness probably has the most interesting history behind it of the Triple Crown races, starting of course with its name. So try not to lose me on this one. The Preakness is named for a horse, Preakness, who won the very first stakes race run at Pimlico Racecourse, the Dinner Party Stakes on the track's opening day in 1870. So named because the idea of the race occurred over a dinner party in Saratoga Springs two years earlier. The race was created and named by former Maryland Governor Odin Bowie. Preakness, the horse that the race was named after, was owned by Milton Holbrook Sanford. He named the horse after the stables he had in New Jersey. Those stables were located in Preakness in Wayne Township, New Jersey. The name Preakness is said to come from the Native American word Proquile, a term used by the Minisi tribe that lived in the area that meant quail woods, which apparently were abundant in the area. A few spelling and pronunciation changes and you have the term Preakness that we know and use today. Everybody getting this soap? Run originally at the distance of a mile and a half, it has the unique distinction among the Triple Crown races of not always being restricted to just three-year-olds. In fact, there were many years when it was run as a handicap race with no age restrictions. The horse Montague technically holds the record of being the oldest horse to win a Triple Crown race, having won the race as a five-year-old in 1890. Despite my searches, I just could not seem to locate a photo of this Preakness champ. Remember, of course, though, that the idea of the Triple Crown was not to be coined till decades after this by racing writer Charles Hatton. So at the time, Montague was not exactly dashing the hopes of any passionate racing fans hoping for a crown. The Preakness was not always held in Maryland. The year that Montague won it? Well, it was held at the Morris Park Racetrack in New York. It also spent some years being run at the old Gravestand track in Coney Island, New York, before it finally came back and settled at its first home, Pimlico, in 1909. For those wondering, Pimlico is known as Old Hilltop because there used to be a, well, hill, or rise in the infield where both horsemen and fans would gather for a great view of the races. To the upsetment of many, the hill was removed in the 1930s to make sight lines better for both fans and the grandstand, and for what was then the dawn of the TV camera age. There's actually a real possibility in the near future that the Preakness will move again, this time across the state to Laurel Park, as many feel that major renovations would need to be done to Old Hilltop and the surrounding area to keep the Preakness in Baltimore. That would kind of be a sad day if it happened. For as then-president of the Maryland Jockey Club, Alfred Vanderbilt, stated, Pimlico is more than a dirt track bounded by four streets. It's an accepted American institution, devoted to the best interest of a great sport, graced by time, and respected for its honorable past. An interesting sort of history also surrounds the blacket of, well, not black-eyed Susans that adorns the winner. In addition to being the state flower and having the colors of the Maryland flag, the Black-Eyed Susan was supposedly also chosen because it has 13 petals on it to represent the 13 original colonies and future states of the United States. The other oddity, as I said, about the choice of using the Black-Eyed Susan is that, well, Black-Eyed Susans aren't in full bloom in May, so they can't be used for the blanket. For a time, they used daisies, which had their centers blackened with ink to give that appearance, but that idea and tactic kind of fell out of favor after a while, and today, the blanket is really made of Viking palms, which look very similar to Black-Eyed Susans. 
it takes a team of florists at least eight hours to make sure that every bloom is perfectly hand placed on that blanket that will adorn the winner. So what's the most expensive trophy in all of sports? The Stanley Cup? The Vince Lombardi Trophy? The Kentucky Derby Trophy? Nope. That honor goes to the Trophy of the Preakness, the Woodlawn Vase. Supposedly valued at over $4 million, but for many considered to actually be priceless. The vase sits in the Baltimore Museum of Art every day of the year but one, when it receives an armed escort from the museum to Pimlico to be presented to the winner of the Preakness. The Preakness has had many, many, many memorable runnings, but two particular ones stand out in the young lifetime of this passionate racing fan. The first was that epic stretch duel between Sunday Silence and Easy Goer in 1989, a race that the late Jim McKay of ABC Sports referred to as a race that none who saw would ever forget. The other was in 2005, when the amazingly athletic lead Alex went to his knees when clipping heels with Scrappy T at the top of the stretch, yet gathered himself boldly to win that race going away. Come on to take the lead. Scrappy T blew the turn, and he's second on the inside. And it's five legs back. Giacomo will manage only to be third. They're coming down to the finish. And in dramatic style, a fleet Alex, who almost fell at the top of the stretch, has won the Preakness by five lengths. Well, there you go. Kind of everything you wanted to know about the Preakness, and it is a very, very interesting history, really, of a race when you look at uh, who it was named after, how it evolved, and how it transported all over the East Coast there for a while, uh, you know, before it finally settled at its home at Pimlico, and uh, really whether it remains at Pimlico is a topic for much debate these days, and who knows, it may not be there much longer. As far as my picks for the Preakness, well, um, obviously, as those of you that follow my segments, I totally ignored Always Dreaming uh, in the Derby, and obviously uh, that was at my own peril. I do think that he still is the horse to beat. Uh, whether that whole, you know, a Pletcher horse running back on only two weeks angle comes back to get him a little bit. Uh, certainly no evidence of him slowing down at all in the mornings or having any problems. Uh, so he definitely is the one to beat. I think Classic Empire is probably the one that's going to give him the most run for his money. It's going to be a much more fair run race. He's obviously not going to be knocked sideways at the start. Uh, and the track will be fast, uh, according to current weather predictions. So I, I do think that that's really going to play in his favor. I think he's the most likely one to beat, uh, always dreaming in the Preakness. I think Gunavera is uh, very interesting, especially at 30 to 1 on the morning line. I think that's kind of an overlay there, especially picking up Mike Smith. Um, he's definitely one you don't want to leave out. And the, the, the mystery horse to me in this race really is cloud computing. I don't know what to make of this horse. I do like him a lot. I respect Chad Brown. I just don't know if he is going to be seasoned enough to go against these types right now. I think, you know, he might be a better second season horse. But hey, that's why they run the race. And that's, uh, you know, what we're going to find out. Hope everybody has an absolutely wonderful Preakness weekend, especially if you're there. Again, God, I envy you. Um, enjoy as many crab cakes as you want. Hope the race is safe for all and uh, we get a true run race. And uh, that's about going to do it for this segment. If you are interested in having a race name research by us, drop us a line here at Therofan. I'll be happy to look it up for you. And you never know, it might end up on a future segment. I'm Doc for Therofan, and we'll see you next time on The Name Behind the Race. If you're an incredibly passionate Thoroughbred Racing fan and want to find a whole bunch of people that are just like you, why not check out Thoroughfan at Thoroughfan.com. Sign up to become a member, get our amazing weekly newsletter, and learn everything and anything there is to know about this amazing sport we call Thoroughbred Horse Racing. Thoroughfan, giving the fans a voice.